Hey everyone, on the next episode of Noon, I'm excited to introduce you to JJ, a dedicated and seasoned paramedic who's become a cornerstone for the successes of emergency medical services in his community. JJ's impact extends beyond his paramedic role. He serves as a guiding force for future paramedics and EMTs, emphasizing not only their successes in their careers, but also preventing burnout and compassion fatigue. Through the sharing of his experiences and education, JJ cultivates an environment that nurtures both professional growth and personal well-being. Join us for an inspiring conversation as JJ reflects on his long and impactful career as a paramedic, discusses the crucial aspects of mentorship, and shares insights on how to build a resilient and successful EMS community. This episode promises to be a compelling exploration of the human side of EMS. Let's get started. Hey, JJ, thank you so much for joining us on the 911 Nonsense Podcast. I appreciate you coming out today. Hi, how are you? I'm doing well, but can I go ahead and get an introduction? Sure. So uh, my name is JJ Arnold. I'm a paramedic and firefighter uh, in a rural EMS system here in our state. Uh, I've been uh, doing that for about uh, 13 years. Um, I'm a father of four kids, a husband, and um, I don't know what else you want to do. I've been, I've been doing EMS for a long time. A long time. You said that you're with your current company for 13 years? Yes, I've been with the, well, I've been in the EMS, I've been with them for a little over 15 years, but I've been in the same station now for about 13 years uh, outside of, of our, our big metropolitan here. That's awesome. So you don't have too much longer to go till you are able to retire out. No, I've got uh, 54 months, not that anybody's counting, but yeah, yeah, 54 months uh, from today, I'm eligible for retirement. I don't know if I'll retire, but I'm eligible. So that's the cool thing. That's really cool. Um, do you plan on staying with fire for a long time or do you plan on going maybe more EMS or do you have other plans? Well, no, so I've been EMS my entire career. So it's a fire department that has EMS, but unlike some of the city systems, we don't, we don't do like a two tier system. I'm the only EMS provider for the whole area. Um, and I think my ultimate goal would be to, I don't know, I, I've gone back and forth. I think there's some other fun stuff I may consider doing, but we'll see. That's really cool. So as a single tier system, um, you guys are the only ones or the rescue is the only one that responds to the 911 calls or do you sometimes get like a rescue and an engine no we, we normally respond with four people so we have two on the engine two on the rescue um and then if we need more assistance or we need more help we'll call for the other so we have a six-man crew uh you know 24 365 um with a with a six-person crew but only four usually respond to every call that's really cool that's a really neat i've only ever worked for two tier systems so i find the single tier systems kind of intriguing like almost feels like it's not enough people but it sounds like it is well and, and for a long time it wasn't we went from four to, to five to six um it, it definitely struggles a little bit where we struggle a little bit with um, depending on what the, what the situation is um but it's all i've ever known so i really don't know anything better or different no, that makes sense. And are you guys increasing your numbers because the population is increasing or are you increasing just because the call volume has increased? Um, a little bit of both. Obviously, the population increases the call volume. So um, I would say we're probably doing a little bit of both, but it's more about like understanding that if we have more people on scene, we could do better patient care. And so we're, we're increasing our numbers for a long, long time. For probably the first eight years of my career, I was the only medic in the area. And so if what we would do is we would respond with like four guys. And if it was an ILS call, then I might send the ILS crew in on my med, you know, hand off, hand off the keys to the NARC drawer and be like, okay, guys, good luck. And then if the next call came out and it was an ILS or an ALS call, I would respond and wait till the ambulance got back. And we decided about five years ago, give or take, that uh, that would be easier if I just had a, a med that was dedicated to me as being the only ALS provider. Wow. That's got to be kind of scary, right? It's extremely scary. It's the hardest thing I've, I've probably done for my career was to do some of those kind of things, like be like, well, this is on the borderline. It could be ILS, but they could be having a cardiac arrest or they could be having a, a cardiac episode. And so it was one of those where I'd like jump in the back of the truck when we get to the hospital and they're like, oh, it's just indigestion. 
And then other times we, I'd get in the back of the truck and we'd ride all the way to Albuquerque and it would be a legitimate call. And it was really weird to like hand off a call. I really like it much better when I'm not handing off a patient. I have that problem. I think a lot of my friends that know me from my 911 experience <laughs> realize that because I chose to take the patient every single time, right? Where we were in a system where if you worked with a basic or an intermediate, the paramedic could make that decision to let the basic or the intermediate right in the back and the paramedic would drive. And I had a hard time doing that, knowing that if I made a mistake, that was my license, right? So if I chose right. to let my EMT or my, or whoever right in the back um, and something was wrong and could have been potentially um, deadly, that that is my license. Oh, absolutely. And, and I think that's the hardest part even now. Um, we just talked about this last, what, probably 10 days ago or so, that I have done over 2 million miles in the back of an ambulance. And I would say that the part of that is the fact that I am unwilling to like, number one, put somebody else in that situation where I'm going to, I'm going to give them a patient that's above their head or above their skill level. But the other side of it is I'm not willing to like risk my license or risk my job to say, Hey, like you're a great provider, but if something goes South, we have to switch places, which has happened. But I, I just don't, what, what's the point of risking that? Yeah, no. And I definitely had a couple of partners that would get upset when I, if it was a simple, like, a slow MBA and the patient's complaining of neck pain, I would get partners that would be upset that I wouldn't let them right in the back to get that experience. But it's hard. It's hard to turn over that patient. It very much is. We, we, we've we decided in the last probably five years or so, I have a, we have an engineer that comes with us and a captain. And a lot of times what I'll do is I'll put my engineer, I'll just say, hey, dude, you drive. This patient probably is not going to have any issues, but let me get the engineer to drive and I'll get my intermediate or basic partner to do 99% of the patient care and I'll sit in the airway seat and just watch and make sure. And that, that gives them experience if something goes south, but it also allows a, a learning opportunity. Yeah, no, that's really cool. And that is a great learning opportunity. I wish we had, I mean, if we had had another person that could ride in the, or drive, you know, that definitely could have been a viable option, but working in the 911 system, it's you and your partner, you know, so it made it hard. Yes, um, so absolutely. It sounds to me like you enjoy instructing. So is that something you do on a regular basis? Absolutely. So I have um, I own a small CPR company here in town, um, which I know you do some CPR training and stuff. I've done that for a long, long time. Um, I worked at a couple of different uh, local colleges throughout the years um, as an instructor. And then uh, I probably take, based on where we're at, rural EMS, you know, we have a 30 to 45 minute transport from the patient's home or patient location to the closest facility. Um, it's a great opportunity to learn medicine and so i've taken a, a lot of students in fact i was i was listening to a few of you the podcast previously and i would say 10 or 12 of those that you've had on this podcast before have been interns that i've worked with in the past um as a paramedic student as a that's paramedic a huge person, number um had the opportunity yeah yeah it's quite a few um it's been kind of funny it was it, there was a couple and i don't want to mention names but there was a couple that i was like oh i remember this time or that time and i've listened to one of your one of the podcasts and i've sent them a text message while I'm listening to you're like, hey, remember this this story? You forgot to mention this story, um, that kind of thing. And so it's been a great opportunity being in this this world for quite a long time now that I could uh, listen to the podcast and, and see these guys and see where they've gone and see what they've done in the future. Oh, that's super cool, super cool. So what, out of all of the classes that you teach, what's been your favorite class to teach? Um, it depends on who I'm teaching to. So like I've done ACLS and PALS for a long time and that's great when I'm teaching to EMS people it's difficult when I'm teaching to the, the hospital. Um, I think pre-hospital is it's a EMS, in, in the EMS world or, or the emergency medicine world, pre-hospital medicine is very, very different than hospital medicine. And so if I'm teaching a class full of pre-hospital providers, I, I love it. If I'm teaching a class full of hospital or, or tacticians in a facility, that's a very different class. So I don't know if I'd say one's better than the other, but I probably enjoy the pre-hospital side of things a little bit better. Yeah, no, and I can completely agree with that. I would say that, uh, you know, I haven't been teaching a long time for the AHA stuff, but it's really interesting when you get those nurses um, or techs or even doctors that have been doing this for, you know, 10, 15, 20 some odd years and they still struggle, right, to recognize rhythms or define those treatments in the algorithm. Right. Absolutely. Well, and I think we, we see it differently, right? Because they're like, oh, we have a thousand tests to run. 
well, I have like some vital signs and a couple little things I can do, but it's not, I don't have the extensive time to waste. Like I'm in the house for 12 minutes. And so that, that, you know, whatever, 10 minutes, whatever it looks like, we have to like diagnose something and begin to treat um, in that 10 to 12 minutes where the, I think some of the times hospital clinicians or, or non pre hospital people have a little more time. And I think that's where the, for me, it's a lot more fun to figure out what's going on or what I think is going on and start treating much earlier than if I was in the hospital setting. Now that's a great answer. That's really cool. I like teaching. And I think that's probably my next step in my career is moving down an, an education side. Hopefully that works out, but we'll see. <laughs> Which is funny because my I think my next step may be going where you're at now with like looking into flight and looking into maybe doing something along those lines in the future. I don't know for sure, but, and I don't know what the future holds, but that's something I've considered in the last couple of years or um, considered once I retire, get closer to retirement, maybe doing something and then sort of in the nursing realm mm -hmm. and then doing um, thermal medicine, going down to South America, going to other, I've, I've been to a couple other countries and run a few clinics. And uh, I think I want to do something maybe more in that sort of clinic rural medicine with the pre-hospital experience, but not necessarily being the guy in the back of the ambulance, maybe being the guy at the clinic that calls the ambulance. So we'll see. Sure. And what, um, what draws you to that? Um, well, I, I, I don't know. I, I think medicine in general, I think uh, my career started early on with, you know, 911 and, and working. In fact, we worked at the same Southern company. I'm not going to mention any names, but we worked down there similarly at the same time. And it was very much wild west medicine. And I enjoyed the wild west medicine, right? Of trying to figure out what was going on, having an hour transport time or more um, from the middle of nowhere and trying to figure out what do I do in the next hour to make sure that medicine works and getting them to the hospital, getting them the definitive care. And then I, I, I've had the opportunity to go to a few other countries and do the same similar thing, but more in a pop-up kind of setting and realize like what we do here, what we do in the back of an ambulance is so much more advanced than they can do in those other countries. And so therefore I wanted to, I, I think that's probably my next goal is to figure out how do I incorporate the two and go to like places like South America or West Africa um, and realize that those, the medicine that needs to be done there is so similar to what we're doing in the pre-hospital setting and people are dying because of simple, simple things. How do we fix that? How do we medicate? How do we, how do we eradicate that? How do we fix that? Have you only worked in New Mexico? I've only been paid to work in New Mexico. So I've done, um, I went to Romania, I've been to Greece, I've been to South or West Africa. Um, I've been to some of those places and I didn't get paid for any of it, but I worked in some of those and I'll be doing some pop-up clinics in some of those places. That's really cool. So you already have that experience and you know what to expect. So you, you look forward to going back to that. Absolutely. I think that's probably where my future, my, my, I have a, a 15 year old daughter, almost 15. Um, who her intent is to be a nurse when she when she gets out of high school. And so the, the, maybe the plan, tentatively the plan would be that we would, her and I would work in some clinics in some other countries um, and figure out how to make all of that work. So that we'll see, I, I don't know. I, I love the ambulance, I love rolling down the road, but I, I don't know if that's, if I can, how much longer I can do that. Yeah, no, that's super cool. And I get, I get the timing stuff, right? Cause we're getting up there in age and we're trying to figure out yes. how long we can go, right? How much further we can go with our careers. Right. Absolutely. So I think education is a good way to go, especially, you know, cause you've been in it a long time. I've been, in, I've been doing it almost 20 years now. Um, I feel like the next generation's ready for us. <laughs> yes, I think so too. I think so too. It's, it's a weird <laughs> experience to be in the fire, to be in the firehouse and like, in the morning these guys come in to like change shifts and they're brand new and they're green and they're they're brand new and they're like 21 years old and i'm mm -hmm. or 20 years old and i'm like you're not even old enough to know what to do like how how and i, I suppose i was in that same place right i was in my mid-20s when i started this but you think about it now in my you know mid to late 40s and i start thinking like these guys really need some education and some time and so someone who's willing to invest in them when when i think you and i started um, you walked in and you had these old crusty medics and I'm not trying to use that term lightly, but we had these guys that have been doing this forever and they just hated the world. And I'm trying to, to hopefully change that a little bit, like explain to them, this is what we do and this is why we do it and uh, get the opportunity to really spend some time versus just being like this crusty old medic that hated everybody and everything and 
you know, chain smoked a, a pack of cigarettes between calls and, you know, those kind of old crusty medics that I think we both dealt with. Yeah, no, for sure. For sure. And I won't lie. Uh, there was a period of time when I worked in my 911 uh, service that I was that crusty old medic, you know, not even that old, but I was pretty crusty because it, the burnout rate was so high, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. No, I completely agree with that. I think the the call volume, the the opportunity to become crusty, and I think that's what in the last couple of years I've shifted and been like, no, I need to teach these guys all the things I I I want to teach them, and, and that I think they need to know. And I think there's a part of it that with 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 our medicine, especially pre-hospital medicine, where compassion and empathy and sympathy is a way better medication than fentanyl, or a way, you know what I mean? In, in that sense, like. What the things that we can do, the things that we can teach them to teach the, the fact that we can hold their hand and do some things are much better. Oh, I agree with that. Do you think that the people who educated us way back in the day uh, had these same thoughts too? I think some of them did. Um, I mean, I had a, I had an instructor way back when that we both can remember um, who taught us some of those things, but maybe didn't express it the way he should have. That makes sense. And how, like, what are you going to do to break that that hurdle or to jump over that hurdle um i think the biggest thing i can do is is make sure that i think i think 90 percent of what we do in in hospital medicine is um, hand holding and tear wiping and if i can convey that to my patient or not to patients to my my predecessors people coming after me that that's what the patients call us for they don't call us because they're having a, they're having the worst day of their life or having a bad day sometimes they just need someone to hold their hand wipe their tears tell them it's going to be okay and, right. and a lot of times I think we get in some where they, they're so afraid and they're so scared and we may not be able to fix anything. We may be able to drive them from point A to point B, but if I can hold their hand and tell them how great they are um, and they're going to be okay on that journey, I think that medicine is huge compared to what we could, other things that we couldn't do. And I think that we teach medicine, teach exactly what needs to be done, right? If, if they have this symptom, we have this solution, et cetera. Um, versus just saying, hey, like, I'm just going to hold your hand and put a little, you know, nasal cannula in and we're just going to have a conversation for 20 minutes. Sometimes that's better medicine than giving 20 drugs that I know how to give. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree with that. And I feel like that's going to lead to probably a higher rate of compassion fatigue. So how do you, how do you prevent that? Um, I think remembering that we're, we're put here for a purpose. Um, I was, I, I've been doing this for a little while now, um, 20 something years plus. And I think that there was days when I was like, I want car accidents and I want like, you know, the crazy calls, the, the silly stuff, the gunshots, blah, blah, blah. I want all of that. And I realized that those are so few and far between and the hand holding and the tear wiping and holding someone's hand for the last time or taking them from their home to the hospital and knowing that they're never going to come home is something that we, we bypass a lot. And I need to, to be better about teaching that. That's so hard, right? Especially like, how do you explain that to students and orientees and third riders? Like they will not get that experience until they're in it. Right. Right. And I, I don't know. I, I wish I had like this, this clear, perfect moment. I, and I, I had an instructor once um, long ago who told me you're going to have your epiphany moment. You're going to have this moment when all of it starts to make sense. And I, I, I think for each one of us, it's individually, it happens like, I probably had it three or four years into my career as a paramedic before I really reached that epiphany moment where I was like, no call necessarily. I'm not saying it doesn't scare me, but I'm not intimidated by the call. However, a lot of calls really just need someone to hold their hand and wipe their tears and tell them it's going to be okay, even if it isn't, because that's what they're looking for. They already know they're dying. They already know that they're in trouble. They already know that their, their systems are failing, their body's failing. What they need is someone to tell them it's going to be okay for the next couple of hours. And not just for the patients, but the, for the family too, right? The people, the bystanders that are all right there. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, I, I have a good friend of mine who, her and I have been going back and forth um, for the last couple of years on that sympathy versus empathy kind of idea. And I think I'm, I can be pretty sympathetic, but I'm not always the most empathetic person. And so I can be like, yeah, this sucks for you and I'm sorry. And I have to take your, your loved one and your family member. And this is just a fucked up situation, but we're going to do this. And she's more like sitting on the couch crying with them and forgetting to even transport the parent because she understands that they're dealing with the situation where I'm like, no, I got to transport the parent. I got to do what I got to do. And so I'm learning that and I'm trying to figure out how to teach that a little bit more. Right. I think it's easy. For, like I was not a big 
not that I didn't transport parents, but it's hard to transport parents because a lot of times they're influencing the way that the patient's feeling, right? So if they're sitting in the Absolutely. corner and they're hysterical, likely the patient is also going to be hysterical. But you also don't want to be the asshole that separates the parent from the patient. <laughs> Well, absolutely. That, that's the like the, the the crazy thing, or vice versa. When you have a brand new parent, right? I think mm -hmm. a big part of that is when I have that brand new parent, and they're they're scared to death, right? They're they're in their early twenties or whatever, and they've had their first baby, and they're scared to death. And I go, like, you're you're crazy. What are, what are you crying for? Like, your kid's fine, and we have yeah. to learn how to be better about going. Hey, I get it that you're scared, and let me hold your hand, and your kid's fine. Let's let your, let's put your kid over here, and let's just you and me, me, you know, me and mom, or me and dad, or me and mom and dad. Let's have a conversation and let's talk about what scared you and how do we make it better in the future. And I think part of that's a big, I think that's a big part of where we are in medicine. Yeah. So not necessarily just treating the patient, but treating everybody in, on the scene in, uh, in general. That's a really good tactic. Absolutely. So how do you, um, you know, we, as an instructor, we see a lot of really pompous paramedic students that come out and it's not their fault, right? That's, we teach people in, while they're in paramedic school, hey, you need to be the best you can be and you need to believe that you're the best that you can be. And something I think that I've learned in the last few years is we shouldn't be teaching our paramedics like this, right? Be, uh, be prepared, expect the unexpected, okay? And be humble enough to know when it's something that you don't recognize to ask for assistance. Absolutely. I, I have a, a good friend of mine who's a, uh... Um, he just recently retired a good paramedic um, been doing this for a long long time and he once said something to me early on in my career that he said i have forgotten more than you learned and he said so when you get to the place where you think you know it all remember there's so many people out there that know more than you and don't be afraid to ask for help and it took me a little while but i think it was hopefully not too long but it took me a little while to realize like i don't know everything and so I try to instill that in new paramedics coming out. Like, dude, I'm telling you, the book is great and the book teaches you a lot of things, but the book really tells you that everybody's the same size and everybody's exactly the same and everything is going to work out exactly the same on every patient. And that's not the case. Yeah. And so learn to treat your patient, learn to treat your, the situation rather than treat what the book thinks you should treat. And I think that comes, I mean, truly there's no other way to explain it, but you know, with, with time comes wisdom. And so in this in this job unfortunately or fortunately you have to have a little time in before you get that wisdom and i wish we could figure out a way and, and if there's somebody out there who knows better than me who can who can truly say that like hey i've been doing this for an hour and i know more than you and I, my wisdom is greater than yours teach me how to teach that wisdom because i think unfortunately you have to be a medic for a little while or be in the system for a little while before you get that wisdom yeah no and i again, you know, 20 years in, I still feel like there's so much that I have to learn. I passed my FPC and went to a guy that I greatly respect and told him like, hey, look, I learned what I needed to to pass this test, but I still don't feel like a critical care flight paramedic. Help me, you know, help me do this. <laughs> and uh, right. we sat down, we've had a lot of conversations, but well, and I think that truly, like, again, going back to that whole idea, right, like, I can read the book, and, and I feel like the majority of, of EMS providers, right, are type A personality, we can read something, we can apply it. Um, part of the reason we got into EMS is is that personality, or what, I've, I've heard it called the personality disorder, but I think it's an order um, of, you present a problem, I present a solution, right? Like, that's how my brain works. And it doesn't matter what the problem is, my brain immediately goes to solution, right? but they don't the book teaches you a lot of that but however we need to be better at providing uh, a humanistic portion of that right like i can tell you that the book says i have to do this if this and this but where does that human side come in and i don't know if i have the answer but i know that that's what we probably need to be working harder on like yes i can pass the test i'm really good at what i do um but am i human am i am i teaching it the the, the right way Right. The patient's not a dummy that we're working on like we do in class. It's an actual person. Right, right. And, and the thing is, you know, I remember a long time ago, somebody saying, like, treat the patient, not the monitor. And, and I agree with that, but it's hard to do both of those, especially when you're brand new, right? Because you're like looking at vital signs and you're looking at that cardiac rhythm and you're looking at what's happening. And you're like, everything looks pretty good here, but the patient doesn't look good. 
where you're like everything looks great on the you know look, the patient looks like looks phenomenal but the the cardiac monitor and the the vital signs all look like shit so how do i manage between those two and i think that just takes that wisdom that time to really manage that sure right and maybe understanding and i think you did comment this earlier maybe understanding that you're not necessarily going to fix the problem you're going to get them from point a to point b which is half of what we do i would say maybe more than half maybe 70 percent of what we do is just get them from their home their wherever that to happen right whether it's a car accident or their home or whatever getting them from there to that sort of next step definitive care and and i think that's a big part of of the ptsd sort of aspect that i've i've learned in the last couple of years is i'm not going to save everyone right but my goal is to get them from here to there and if i can get them from here to there alive and breathing the next person can help out or the next you know the person who has a little more knowledge than me or a little more experience than me um, can get that thing in there sure and since you talked about PTSD, is that something that you seek treatment for? A hundred percent. Yes, ma'am. I, I think if, if, you know, one of the, the things that I've talked about recently in the last few years about the bringing in those new guys is bringing in those new people is I wish I would have, I would have sought out or thought about therapy sooner. And I don't know if it's, it was more of a, the generation sort of that we, we, we kind of came into this, right. Where nobody sought therapy. Right. I, I think about the fact that like the first few medics that I worked with were like these older you know, just post Vietnam vet sort of angry, bitter old men that were like, nobody seeks therapy. Like if you go to therapy, you're a loser, right? Where I think if we would have had some people saying like, no, you're in the academy right now. You haven't even faced your first call. Find a therapist, find someone you can be friends with, find someone you can get to find the people that will help you and figure out a routine that sort of moves you in that direction. Um, we would be, we'd be a whole lot better off. Yeah, I definitely deal with the PTSD side of things, and it's not great. It's uh, like PTSD it's great, in you know, general is not great, or it's not great for you specifically. Um, it was just it was a, it was a weird dynamic, right? Because I didn't think I, I was like I don't need therapy. I'm you know I'm I'm a I'm a full. I was 30 years old when I became a paramedic, and um, I was like, no, I'm an I'm an adult. I have kids. I have a life. I have a mortgage. Like. I don't need to go to therapy. I, I've, I've already, I've already like, if I was going to have a screwed up life before this, I already screwed up everything I was going to screw up. Now, now I'm, I'm an adult and I'm a man um, or I'm, you know, whatever, I'm an adult and I need to not deal with that therapy. And there was a lot of guys in the, in the early times of my life when, when they were like, no, nobody goes to therapy. And I wish I would have, somebody would have been like, no, go to therapy now, get a therapist now. Like before you need it, get a therapist, get someone you trust, get someone you're into. So I, I, I don't know if that answers the question, but I think if, if I could give one piece of advice sort of in that realm is, is and I, I do it all the time, I go to the academy and I talk about getting a therapist now. While you're in the academy, get a therapist. While you're in the academy, start figuring out, and it may not have to be a therapist, right? It can be a friend, it can be a pastor, it can be a, whoever that is, but find that confidant, that someone that you can go to and explain to them that call, right? That dead baby call, which a horrible kind of analogy, right? But you're going to have that eventually. And if you have no one to talk to, you you got to have you got to find that person to go talk to. So, would you say that your current workplace provides uh, good resources for that kind of stuff? Um, I don't know that the like of course like every other organization right? we have the EAP, which has no idea what we do. Um, and so, yes and no. I think that our union, um, being a firefighter, we have a union. Um, in, in private EMS and, and some, of, some of those other things, they don't have that union capability. Our union sought out and found a organization that was willing to help us with therapy. So, and in, in currently, yes, I have good therapy. Um, I think there's an organization, a couple of organizations, and we've, I, we've talked about this a little off, kind of off air and off topic, but um, there's some good organizations now in Albuquerque that can help with that. Um, there's some good friends of ours, Rob being one of them. Um, who does some things in that realm, um, but it wasn't there initially. And so, yes, we have some opportunities. My union is very, I'm very fortunate that my union pays for that out of union dues. So if I want to go, I can go um, to therapy in multiple different places, but I think it needs to be done globally. Yes. Um, we need we need to make sure we're better about that. We're better about saying, hey, look, I don't care what the therapy is about, whether it's about you know, because because sometimes we, we I think we get to this place, and I know we're a little off topic here, but talking about PTSD or therapy in general, um, we get to this place where we don't know what to do, right? And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's because of a call, because we don't recognize that, right? I don't recognize that the fact that so and so died, or this person died, or this thing happened, 
um, that's messing with me, but I know that my marriage isn't great or I'm not being great to my kids or I'm not having a good relationship with my friends and I don't know how to fix all of that. And I, being able to go to therapy for all of those reasons and realizing that they probably stem back to something else is really the big key. And so understanding and getting that therapy early and being able to, to have some of that person to talk to, right? Because I would get off work and go home and talk to my wife and she would ask me about how my shift was and I'd be like, oh, it's fine. It was fine, right? Because I don't want to burden her with the fact that I just yeah. like pronounced four people dead, right? Yeah. Like you don't, you don't want to do that. Like, and so not having that person to go and talk to, I think definitely can mess up relationships and mess up marriages and mess up um, time with your kids, whatever, however you want to justify that relationship, right? Whether it's with a significant other, it's with your children, it's with your friends, it's with your family. Um, if we don't know how to, to deal with those things, we can definitely make some bad decisions. Yeah, no, for sure. And great answer to that, dude. That's, it's, uh, it's uh, hard, right? It's hard. And it's hard at our age, admitting that we do need therapy. And I think yes. we're just, we're in a great place now, I think in the world where it is being recognized that everybody should be seeking some form of therapy or a therapeutic outlet. Absolutely. And, and I think it goes back and forth, right? Everybody has their different thing. I have a really good friend of mine, guy I've worked with, been on the same crew with for 12 plus years now, and he doesn't see a therapist, but he works out every single day. And he's got a wife that understands, for the most part, what he's going through. She works in medicine also, a little bit different avenue, but she works in medicine. And his whole thing is I can go to the gym and I can work out for two or three hours. And that is his therapy, right? Well, I can go to the gym and I can work out too. But that isn't always how I deal with it. So right. I that need does, to be able that to for me, it, it doesn't clear up up here. I still have too much to think about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. I can go to the gym and work out for hours, and it's great, and it's good for my body, but it doesn't necessarily always clear my mind. And so I think finding that avenue, whatever that avenue is, um, to be able to deal with certain things. You had talked about a couple of resources that we have here in, in Albuquerque, and we had talked about Skulls for Hope. What other resources are there? Um, I think that there's P PSPG. PSPG, uh, okay. Yep, I've heard yeah, of that one. PSPG, I, I love those guys. They're great. Um, there's that one, again, like you said, Matt, Skulls for Hope. Um, there's the latter one, and I, I forget the name of it, but like Next Rung, I think is what it's called. Yep, which Next is Rung. Which Rob situation. Um, and then there's there's a couple others that are happening. There's a um, an opportunity for some, I, I know it's not it's still, still sort of in the works, but there's some opportunities for, for vacations. So you can take your family and go on a little vacation, whether that's to Colorado. There's a couple little organizations here in New Mexico that are just getting started um, mm -hmm. where you can go and go camping or you can take your kids and go fishing or you can take your, uh, you know, your significant other and you guys can go stay in a hotel and have a nice uh, massage and, you know, kind of those things. And it's it's done at a very discounted rate um, as a as a you know, first responder, as someone who's been in this business for a little while. Obviously, Sammy, we don't make any money. No, um, we, we do this because we love it. We don't do it because we're going to get rich. Um, and so sometimes I think that also can be an issue where you're like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. I, I'm so stressed out. I have all this stress. And so I can either go spend 30 bucks at the bar or I can go spend 30 bucks to stay in a hotel room for the night with my significant other, have a nice dinner. Um, and so I think there's some organizations, and I don't want to spoil anything yet, but there's some things that are in the works for that that are really going to make things a whole lot better in the next couple of years. And it, that's something that you are connected with? Absolutely. So I, I, I'm, I'm really, really good friends with a, a guy here locally. Um, he had to retire due to P PTSD. Um, he had some traumatic calls and some things that happened, and he just could not work anymore. And uh, one of his goals was, how do I make this better? How do I provide something that I didn't get? And I'm not saying that, you know, the organization I work for, the department I work for is phenomenal. They try really hard. We have some great guys there. Um, but they're not able to necessarily find that next step. And so he was like, well, how do I make it better? And so he started an organization in the last year that um, is allowing for some of those things, right? Hotel rooms that we can get here, even in just in town, right? I mean, don't get me wrong. I'd love to get out of town occasionally, but if we can just get a hotel room here for a night, right? No kids, no bills, no cleaning the house, none of all that other garbage. And just go stay in a hotel room, have a nice dinner, get a massage, whatever, um, spend some time with my family or spend some time with just my significant other or whatever that looks like. Um, he's working on some of those things. And so I think there's that. And then we, you know, on, on previous podcasts, you've had stuff in Colorado. We're working with them. Um, that kind of thing with, with having a ranch like that has in Colorado. I want to, I want to help get one here in New Mexico. 
um, and we're very close to just sort of making that happen. And again, I don't want to spoil anything just yet. Um, and I will reach out to you when that is 100% because I don't want to say something and then it, some big fall through or something weird happened. But um, we're, we're very close to making that happen with some private property um, in the northern New Mexico area up near Taos um, where we're going to have some some camping area where you can go and, you know, whether you take your motor home or you take a tent or whatever you want to do and have some cabins and bathrooms and some things um, on some property up there where you can just go as a first responder and spend some time um, alone by yourself but with people if that makes sense um, and and get that opportunity so yeah we're definitely working towards those kind of things and, and trying to figure out the best way to do all this PTSD. Well it sounds like a great opportunity and I really hope that that comes to fruition for you and for the gentleman that you were talking about I think I think that more resources like that are very needed very very needed and I would like to keep in contact with you um, to give you a couple of ideas that I have uh, regarding that kind of uh, situation. So is there any major regrets in your work or in your job or in your life that you would change? Yeah, I think so. I think, uh, um, and I kind of mentioned a little bit earlier, I think the biggest, I don't know if I'd call it a regret because I think regret means that you would, that you, that you would do something different. And I would do something different, but I don't know. I don't know. Um, I would say that getting therapy a little bit sooner, um, knowing that, you know, I'm, I'm 20 years plus into this career now and I love my job. I love what I get to do. And I love the fact that I get to make a difference in the world, even if it's a small difference, even if it's a slight difference, I'm, I still feel like we as EMS providers make a difference in the world. Um, but I would have gotten help with how to deal with when I couldn't make a difference or when I didn't feel like what I was doing was making a difference. Um, so I say the regret or the change I would make would be getting help sooner rather than later. Um, I, I think that's a big part of it, being able to not feel so, I don't know, I, I mean, for lack of better terms, and this may sound horrible, and I don't, I'm not trying to offend anyone, right? But like the idea of like being this pompous, arrogant ass, which is when I came into EMS, that's what everybody was, right? If you were, if you, so, if you, if you were seeking out therapy, if you wanted to talk after a call, other than what we screwed up on, um, you were just being kind of a baby about it, right? Versus it being like, no, this call affected me. And it may be the stupidest thing that affected me, but something on this call affected me and I need to talk about it and not being afraid to do that. So I guess my regret, regret would be is, I think I was a little bit too macho at times. And, and I, when that macho sort of atmosphere was there, I didn't, I didn't speak up or say things that I should have said. Like, no, this really did affect me and it's okay to be upset and it's okay to cry and it's okay to, to be angry or upset or have feelings after a call um, versus when I first, like I first started and I think you were, you were pretty similar in the timeline. Um, it just wasn't something you did, right? You went back to the fire station after a call and you were like, screw it, let's clean the trucks and let's do our thing. And right. Versus it being like, no, I really need to talk to someone and I, I, I can't go home right now because I have to, we have to sit down and talk about this before I go home. Because when I go home, I'm going to be angry for the rest of the day, or I'm going to, I'm going to react differently to my family than I should have. And I really wish I would have learned that early on so that I didn't mistreat my family. And, and I think they, I think my family was really good about understanding it, but that's not who I wanted to be. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. And I think I would say that that in, in our age group and in our time frame, I feel like a lot of people feel that way. You know, I think um, we are raising a really good group of first responders, the one that do, you know, stick with the job, um, giving them an understanding of maybe this is something they should be taking care of early, right? Self-care is such a huge issue right now. Huge issue. Absolutely. Yeah, that's hard. Do you feel comfortable sharing some of uh, your more positive stories? I do. I do. So I, I think I, when, you know, kind of getting ready for this podcast or whatever, you know, you, there's the idea of like a, a positive call and a negative call. And I had to really think about, obviously, every call that has a positive outcome or even calls that have a negative outcome are something that could be positive. But I think there's a call that I recall all the time when I feel like I'm having a bad day or I'm having a struggling day, right? And there was this this kind of long story short, there was a, we got called out for a welfare check um, for an 80 plus year old female. And now we get to the house and uh, it's, you know, again, rural New Mexico, 
Um, most people live in houses with wheels underneath them. Uh, not that I'm saying anything negative about that, but that is just the situation that it was, right? So we roll up to this trailer. We're knocking on the doors. We're knocking on the windows. Nobody's answering the doors. Um, and so we finally decide we're going to kick the door in. And we kick this door in, and we go into this house. And we're trying to find this elderly patient. And she's sitting kind of in this laundry room area. Um, and she's sitting right in front of her washer and dryer. And she's just sitting on the floor. And as we walk in, I'm looking at her and I realize that she has passed. She's been, been probably down for a while, um, but she's sitting on the floor and she's got her hands in front of her and she looks extremely peaceful. Like her life has been amazing. She's 80 something years of age. Um, her hands are folded nicely in her lap and she looks peaceful. And so I, it reminds me that a lot of times what we see, what we deal with is traumatic, right? It's a car accident. It's the whatever else right that sudden heart attack while you're having you know thanksgiving dinner with your family like the things that we find traumatic and it was this one was this beautiful wonderful 80 plus year old woman who just died peacefully while doing what she loved to do maybe not laundry that was her favorite thing to do but nonetheless she wasn't upset about her life and so i think that's probably one of my favorite calls of all time was this moment when I could see the peace that comes when you die. And sometimes it can be extremely peaceful and doesn't have to always be traumatic. And when right. we deal with, with death, it's traumatic. Right, because that's what we're trained for, right? Is everything, like you said earlier, it is their worst day. It is the worst thing that's happened to them. That's what we're seeing and that's what we're used to. So we're, we forget how everyday people die. You know, we forget that sometimes it can be peaceful and maybe those ones that go in their sleep isn't such a bad thing. That's a nice one. That was a really pretty one. Yeah. And being able to be like the guy that really walked in and I remember walking in there and I had a, a great partner and a, a good mentor and, and we walk in and he said, all right, we'll go over and you got to pronounce. And I thought to myself, like, what do I need to pronounce? What, what does that, what does that really mean? And I remember walking over and thinking to myself, she looks happy she looks content she looks like her life was not that terrible of a thing and then you know and then and of course there's that moment afterwards right when you walk through the house you're walking back out to the truck you're walking back out to to inform pd that they need to call online you know all these things that happen and you you're, you're looking at the pictures on the walls and you're looking at the hallway and you're looking at the living room and and I know Sammy talked about this a little bit. We we've all we've both been in many many houses that are just trashed and distraught. And you walk in and the the chaos is unbelievable, right? Well, this house was not that. This house was well kept and clean and organized. And there was these amazing pictures on the wall and these beautiful memories of life. And it made me feel like you know sometimes we get the opportunity to be there for someone's last moments or moment. And it's a, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful privilege that we get to be a part of that. Yeah, I agree. Um, and I think it's something that is taken away from us more and more often, you know, as we're seeing more car accidents and more traumatic events, we just see so much of that, that we forget, you know, we forget how, how beautiful and how amazing that transition from life to death can be. And uh, it's another way that we can make a really big impact on um, not only the patients, but their families. Absolutely. And I think that, that you know, a big part of something we've, we've recently transitioned into um, with, with what I'm doing is when we have those moments, right? I take a moment to just look around the house. I, I, I encourage my crew to take a moment to look around the house um, and not look around like we're not snooping through people's stuff but take a moment to embrace this, right? Like, yeah, that's funny, right? Embrace this moment, embrace this opportunity to have been a part of this amazing life of 85 plus years or whatever that looks like. Um, because if not, we're gonna, we're gonna screw this up, right? Because everything we're gonna think about, everything we're gonna do is gonna be based on that, that car accident, that shitty, horrible, horrific, five people dead on the side of the freeway because of a car accident call and that's all we're going to be able to remember versus it being we had the opportunity to be there when someone's the last moments or, or close to their last moments and love life and they love life and we need to remember to love life very well put and kind of going in leading into that how easy it is to forget you know do you feel comfortable sharing one of your worst calls 
Absolutely. So, so I, I thought about this for a while, obviously coming, leading up to this podcast and, and there's probably a dozen out there that I could talk about that are horrible, but there's one that, that has, that, that has definitely stuck with me probably longer than most. Um, and that one being long, kind of, it, it's a long call, right? But it started at like four 30 in the morning. We had to call out. So I work in a very rural area. Understand that, that the average response time for me from time of calling 911 till I get on scene can be in excess of 20 minutes very easily um, based on the fact that we're a rural department. And so this call came in at like 5.30 in the morning. Um, it was a car accident that we weren't sure exactly where it was, but it was on a main thoroughfare, um, kind of a highway. Um, you know, average res speed is 65, 70. Um, and so we, we respond out there. It takes us about 18, 19 minutes to get on scene um, as we roll up to this intersection um, in, in sort of Again, again, it's a rural area, right? So it's a bunch of farm roads and farm people. Um, it's these two boys that are on their way to school and uh, they're involved in a car accident with an oncoming truck. And we're not sure exactly what happened, but we know that there's two vehicles involved. Um, there's at least three patients. And so that's kind of the, the general dispatch information that we get. The sun's barely coming up. We're on our way there. And uh, when we have car accidents, a lot of times, especially now or, or more recently, we, we send two ambulances and an engine um, because if there's, you know, depending on a car accident, those who listen to this podcast probably have, um, sometimes when there's car accidents, people are angry and they're arguing with each other, right? So we send two ambulances so that we're not taking patients from car A and patients from car B in the same ambulance. Um, so we send two ambulances and a fire truck and we're on our way there. And it takes us about 25 minutes to get on scene. Um, from the time of the dispatch till when we're able to get there, like running lights and sirens, going as fast as we possibly can. And uh, so we get there, and as we walk up, it's a small um, two-door little Honda sort of car, you know, little, little little tiny car, and then a big, huge farm truck, right? And so we see that there's these two vehicles there, and uh, as we approach the, the two vehicles, and we look over at the truck, and the driver of the truck is like waving, sort of giving that like, I'm okay wave. And, and I think only if you're an EMS, do you understand that I'm okay wave, but sort of given that like, I'm okay. Maybe I have a broken arm or my neck hurts or you know, windshield's busted, but I'm okay sort of wave. And as we approach the car, we realize it's a, it's a small little car. Um, it's been smashed up pretty good. And me and my partner the guy who's now retired that are, is helping me do all of these, these, these next PTSD steps and, and, and acquiring this land and doing some of these other things that we're trying to get done, um, walks over to the car and we're walking over together. And it's the two medics um, as we're approaching and I'm yelling at my guys um, in the engine and the other two guys and they're like, we need extrication gear. Obviously this, this car's in rough shape. And uh, we both approach, he approaches the driver's side, I approach the passenger side. And uh, we, we both kind of re look into this vehicle and there's these two boys. And when I say boys, they were knowing now what I, what I know now versus then, they were young, uh, old enough to drive, but not old enough to be a lot, uh, in life, right? They were, they were high school kids. And uh, I reach into the car and he reaches into the car kind of at the same time. And I reach in and I feel for a pulse. And he reaches in and feels for a pulse. And he looks over the top of the car at me and I shake my head and he shakes his head. And we realize at the exact moment that neither one of these boys are alive anymore. They're, they're, they have reached their demise. They have whatever this car accident took, took them out. And I look at him and he looks at me and uh, we realize this moment, right? This moment that these boys are, 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 are no longer going to do anything, right? And the first thing that comes to your mind is these stupid ass boys. They were texting or they were they were screwing around and they were doing something dumb, right? That goes through your head. And then me as a parent, I go through my head, goes through, what if this was my kid, right? Like it's the sun's barely coming up. Like it's early. They're on their way to school. I don't know why they're going to school early, but they're probably playing a sport. Like all these things start going through your head and you realize like this, these, these kids were just these kids. Right. And, and, and I don't want to get too graphic on the detail. The boys were, were okay. Meaning their, their body was okay. They weren't like the accident just wasn't what it was, right. They were eating breakfast burritos on the way to school. And the only reason I know that is because there was like burrito remains on the windshield in the dash. Right. Because, and it was red chili, which may seem silly, but I can guarantee you it was red chili and it was all over kind of the dash and the thing. And, 
And I thought to myself, like their mom an hour ago, or maybe yesterday or whatever that looked like had made them these breakfast burritos and made them this, this breakfast so that they go to school and go play basketball or go to practice or do whatever they were doing. And again, it's hard to sort of, I think as an EMS provider, once you know a little more about the story, sometimes it changes your perspective on how you see it because I know the whole story now, right? Initially when I got there, I didn't know the whole story. Right. I thought these are just some punk kids who were on their way to school that were probably texting and driving or screwing around or doing whatever. Right. And now they're, now they're dead. Right. Versus it being after the fact and you go, Oh, let me know a little bit more about these people. And needless to say, these were two straight A students. Their, their, their cell phones were in their backpacks in the trunk because their dad had made them promise they would never text and drive. They were eating burritos that their mom had made them the day before because they left early to go to basketball practice before school. Um, and it was just a freak accident, like a completely freak accident that they, for whatever reason, either they blew a tire, which is hard to tell after the fact because the tires are blown out on a car accident a lot of times. They blew a tire and went head on with this, this other truck and this other farmer that was not doing anything special other than going from his home to his field to go feed his cows at 5.30 in the morning. And these guys were headed to school, like all these extra things that happened. But the moment that it made a difference, right, was me looking across the roof of this car at my partner, my friend, at the, at the guy that I have confidence in, and him shaking his head at the same time I shook my head, and knowing that both of us were pronouncing these young kids dead in this car accident. Um, and so why was it the worst? Because not only did I have to do that, but then, you know, part of rural EMS, part of, of what we do is after PD gets there and has to do their investigation and OMI shows up to get their investigation, and then we have to go extricate and take these boys out. And so I want to talk just a, a minute about that at the end of that, right? Because everybody understands that, you know, listening to this podcast, listening to you and I talk about it, that they, these boys were dead. They were dead when I got there. There was nothing I could have done. Same, I, nothing. There was nothing I could have done because I promise you if there was anything I could have done to change the outcome of these boys' lives, I would have but there was nothing we could have done right. So we looked at each other. I looked at him, he looked at me. We, we, we made this high moment connection where we both knew that there was nothing else we can do for these boys. And then we had to go get back in our, our fire truck and run a couple of calls and our ambulances and run a couple of calls in between while the investigation was happening. And then OMI got there and we needed to extricate these boys, right? And it's a mess and we needed to extricate them and so to do that, we had to um, come back and cut the roof off and lift these boys out. And by this time, the mom had been called and the dad had been called and the family and the school and everybody was kind of notified that these boys had passed and that, you know, th this traumatic scenario that they had passed in. And, and we come back multiple hours later. I think it was the call came in at like five in the morning and we didn't get the boys out to like 2.30. Um, and we, we cut the roof off the car and we did all the things that we needed to do. And we pulled these boys out. And as we're pulling the boys out, the entire family, mom, dad, siblings, kids from school. <sighs> Sorry. Um, people that that knew these boys and knew about this family had all showed up to the scene, right? And, and you've been on those scenes probably where you're in, again, rural New Mexico, rural areas where all of a sudden everybody and their, their grandparents and their, their cows and their dogs, everybody's there. And that we pulled these boys out and the entire world sort of stopped for a minute. And the mom came over and asked if the whole community would just pray with these kids. And so every single one of them, and there must've been 40 people there just stopped and prayed with these kids before we loaded them into OMI. Um, and so again, I don't I, Sometimes I think about where am I going with that story? Um, <laughs> These guys were amazing. These boys were amazing. After the fact, you know, they were, again, they were straight A students. They were on their way to basketball practice. They didn't text on their cell phone. They were good kids. Um, and, and times like that when it's, you know, it, it's one of those things where we meet shit bags a lot of times, right? Guys who are just assholes and people that are just suck. And you're like, I, I'm sorry that you're in this situation, but you put yourself in this situation where these boys didn't really necessarily put themselves in this situation. It was just, it was difficult. It was hard to, to pronounce them. That being said, there's a scholarship fund with these boys now. Their mom is an advocate for EMS. Their mom's an advocate for what we do in the pre-hospital setting. Their mom's an advocate for, you know, enjoying the, your children and spending every waking minute you can with them. 
Um, there's two younger siblings to these boys um, who are both now in high school and their mom and dad have not missed a single basketball practice, a single basketball game, a single you know football game, whatever sport their kids are playing. And they, they preach it all the time to the high school, the local high school there that like, you never know when it's going to end and you never know when it's going to be a bad day. And so enjoy the time that you have with your kids because it could happen immediately and, and never change. So I don't know if that, I think I feel like I rambled a little bit on that and I apologize, but um, not at all. That's where it's at. Not at all. And I thank you so much for sharing. I know that's hard. Um, <clears throat> sounds like it was a pretty hard, hard call all around, but it also, when you're telling it to me, okay. And this is just my perspective. Um, it sounds beautiful. You know, it, it's, it's really unfortunate that something like that had to happen. And you know, I, I, without coming across as callous, um, they passed together and then their whole family got to be there with them when they were removed from the vehicle. And it sounds like surrounded by a bunch of other loved ones as well with firefighters that had enough respect to stop and do what they needed to do for that family to make it easier for them. Yeah, absolutely. It was an amazing, it was an amazing, hard opportunity. I, I, the the guy that, again, that I, I, I did this call with, I talked to him probably on a weekly basis now and, or more. And, and if I had to pick like the one dream that I have re reoccurring, whether you want to call it a nightmare or a dream, it's that moment, right? We're standing next to the car and, and looking at each other and both sort of shaking our heads. And then the next part of that dream is, is literally just, you know, 40 people plus kneeling in the street in the middle of this kind of highway and paying respect to these boys that that didn't choose this, but necessarily made a huge impact after the fact in the world. And so it's, it's a great thing both ways. Yeah. I mean, it's unfortunate that it happened, but it sounds like a lot of good has come out of it, which is great. Absolutely. Absolutely. So is, is therapy one of the only things that you do as an outlet uh, to feel better for your PTSD? No, I think, I mean, obviously there's the gym and going to the gym and spending time in the gym. And and, and I think it's different for, again, looking at it from two different perspectives, right? Because I've had the opportunity to work in private EMS and I've had the opportunity to work in, in the fire service. And in private EMS, you're stuck in a truck all day, right? And you don't get the opportunity to like, get out and do stuff right you get out of the hospital and then immediately like especially now right what is level zero for like the last year um yeah <laughs> so right like there's no sort of downtime at the fire station we have some downtime right so in between calls we can work out we can sit at the kitchen table we can drink some coffee we can yell and scream at each other and make fun of each other and do some of those things um in the in the private ambulance you you can't do that so for me anyway it's going to the gym with a buddy of mine like a, a guy that's on my crew or going to the gym at the fire station, getting a workout, you know, it sounds horrible, but like taking a sledgehammer to a tire is some of the best therapy I've ever done. I mean, it, it, you know, getting out there and just beating the shit out of a tire with a sledgehammer, right? Tire didn't do anything to me, but I'm going to make sure it pays for whatever else has been done to me. Right. And so sometimes those kind of therapy things, um, I think for me personally, like hiking a little bit helps jogging, running, um, as I age more, I think running is definitely something that I need to get better at doing or, or become more of. I think running is a really good thing, right? Listen to a really positive podcast, um, mm -hmm. listening to something positive in the, in the, in the world. Um, while I go for a run or go for a walk, I'm getting outside, seeing some sunlight. Um, but for me personally, I think going to the gym is a big part of it. Um, spending time with the kids, um, spending time with my dogs, spending time with my friends, um, I don't think there's a, when I was, when I was young and, and, and again, we don't make a whole lot of money, but when I was young and money was tight, I felt like going and getting a cup of coffee or going and eating lunch with one of my buddies was um, something I couldn't afford to do. And now looking back on it, it's something I should have afforded to do. And now it's something I can't afford not to do. Yeah. Um, you know, getting together with someone and just having a, a, you know, whatever it is, garbage lunch at a pizza place or, um, whatever. And, you know, I'm not a drinker currently, but, um, you know, having a beer with a, with a buddy is a good thing. Um, going and, you know, whatever that looks like, whether that's a cup of coffee, whether that, and just getting an opportunity to spend time socially with someone, I think is huge. Um, but also going to the gym, um, physical stuff, um, something I've tried to been, been better about, um, 
recently is, is going outside every single day. I'm drinking a cup of coffee, sitting in the sun. Um, for those of us who work shift work, whether it's days, nights, you know, I do 48 on 96 off 72 on 72 off, whatever it is, we work days and nights, right? So your, your, your sleep schedule, your life schedule gets kind of screwed up. Um, but going out in the morning and having a cup of coffee before the world sort of wakes up or as the sun's rising, um, is a big deal, right? Getting some sunlight on my face, drinking a cup of coffee, um, experiencing the world. Some of those things are really good for PTSD, um, or, or for stress, maybe not PTSD is not even the right word for stress. Um, I think those are a couple of things, but I think going to the gym is a huge part of it. Um, and finding it, finding something, whatever that looks like. I, I, you know, I have a good friend of mine who, who unfortunately as weird as it may sound is he loves knitting and like making hats. And so like the dude knits all the time, right? There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> right, right. Like, but it wouldn't be like the, the, the hobby you would think he would have, right? But he's like this big goofy dude who's covered in tattoos and, and you know, cusses like a sailor and, and whatever, right? But he likes to knit. And so I'm like, cool, man, go knit for an hour if that's what you need to do. Yeah. Um, whatever that looks like. And I think explore different things, explore things that are going to help you. Um, to make you feel better and and you may not be able to find that I've, I've gone back and forth right for a long time i rode mountain bikes for a long time i rock climbed for a while and i've gone to the gym like and and i don't necessarily rock climb or mountain bike as much anymore and for whatever reason it's just that i moved on to different hobbies because that's what's helped me um i know that most guys most most ems providers um if they haven't already or if they haven't paid attention to it they have something they do when they get off shift um, that's important, right? For me, it was coming home and wiping down countertops. Um, didn't matter if the house was completely clean. Um, I needed a way to get rid of some excess energy. And so I would come home from work and I still do this to this day. I, my first day off in the morning, I walk home, I get home before I go on shift, I make sure dishes are done and the countertops are clean and my, you know, the kitchen's clean, the, the bathrooms are clean, all that kind of jazz. Right. And then I get off of shift and I come home and I clean those same things all over again. And for me, it's just a way to get rid of that energy. And the, the countertop is this, it, it, nothing has touched that countertop in, in, you know, potentially two days in theory or right, you know, whatever. It's not like it's been excessively dirty, but I have to figure out a way to, to, to get rid of that energy. And so cleaning something sometimes helped me. But I think whoever it is, whatever it is, whatever you find that works for you, make sure you do it and, and build that routine just a little bit. Yeah, no, 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 that's really cool. I've heard and talked to a couple of different people that have, um, seen and read studies where you should do something at the end of the shift that signifies the end of the shift to help you separate that work you know and then home life so i'm wondering Absolutely. if that's kind of what you're doing there with wash uh you know cleaning off the counters and doing the dishes and stuff right and, and being fortunate being again at the fire station having a locker having a, a station where i go to i go to work in civilian clothes I go to work in my own clothes. Um, and then when I get off shift, I change clothes. And a lot of guys take a shower and then put on their clothes. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Um, depends on if I'm trying to get out of there. But I leave the fire station in my own clothes. And I get my own vehicle and I go home and there's no, I'm not taking my uniform home with me. And I'm not saying that's bad, do whatever makes you happy. Yeah. But I found for me, that's a big part of it, right? Not Not wearing a uniform when I leave the fire station. Right. For those, the, the time that I'm there, I'm in uniform. I'm, I'm here. I'm wearing my boots. I'm, you know, everything the way it should be. When I leave here, I'm going to wear whatever my clothing is and my own personality. Um, so that when I leave, even if I just go from the fire station to my home, uh, I'm in my own clothes. Yeah, no, that's awesome. You had talked a little bit about your friend who knits and <laughs> you said that he has tattoos. Is that something that's publicly recognized at, at your work? Absolutely. And I think tattoos are, for me personally, and I, we can talk about this a little bit, is I think tattoos are very personal um, when it comes to sort of dealing for me personally, again, with PTSD a little bit. Um, I have a tattoo on my forearm that uh, that I got at the call that I mentioned earlier about the two boys. Uh, I struggled with that call, right? Because I struggled with the idea of what could I have done? And, and again, nothing I could have done would have changed anything, right? But it goes back to the whole idea of, of this is what I, this is what I was designed to do. This is what I was built to do. This is why I'm here on this planet is to make a difference in the world. And on this call, I couldn't make a difference. And so I went and got tattooed on my arm, which is a, a quote from one of my favorite movies um, called the guardian. You may have seen it. It's uh, about uh, 
you know, rescue swimmers and that kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. And I sort of modified it a little bit, but it says, uh, uh, I work as hard as I can, as fast as I can, for as long as I can, and God takes the rest. And I think that's that's a big part of it, right? I'm I'm I study a lot, and I I'm my I feel like my knowledge base is really good, and I'm a pretty good provider. So I work as hard as I can. Um, I do my job to the best of my ability. Um, I work extremely hard to to better my craft, be good at my craft, know what I'm doing, stay studying, stay you know working with the newest techniques, working with whatever the newest thing is, to be really good at my job. And but but understanding that no matter how good I am, God has makes the ultimate decision or something other other you know whatever that looks like for me it's God for other people it may not be but um, makes that decision and. I'm only as good as I can be. And I think that's a huge thing that I found after the fact when I had it tattooed on my arm so that I wouldn't forget, right? I work as hard as I can, as fast as I can for as long as I can, and God takes the rest. I give it everything I have. I do everything I can. And when I have those calls that are really difficult, I can look down at my forearm and see it, read it, and understand it, that I'm only as good as I can be today. And I yeah, think there's no, a lot of guys great. that I know of recently um, that have tattooed themselves with those with very similar things, right? whether that be the moment that they, they had that, that last call or that moment that they had something else, right? And once you sort of journal it um, or write it down or deal with it, you can move forward from it, which is a big part of, of sort of the PTSD journey that I'm on now is journaling a little bit more. Um, but for me, it was tattooing it on my body reminds me that I have done this. I've done the best I possibly can, and now it's time for me to move on. I've recently come into a quote myself. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm trying to remember which episode it was on. I don't know if it's come out. I think it has, but the um, the quote, this too shall pass. I absolutely love that quote, whether you're talking about it in a good time or a bad time, you know, that's just, that really, really spoke with me. This too shall pass. I really love that one. Oh, and maybe I'll work on getting a tattoo. Um, you keep You keep mentioning about how if you could have done anything different to save those two boys, you would have. And then you also keep interjecting that there was obviously nothing that you could have done. You are absolutely incorrect, my friend. There are things that you could have done differently. You could have been an asshole and you could not have held or waited to put those boys away and you didn't. You could have been so disrespectful and been like those crusty medics that, you know, taught us several years ago or that we are seeing and developing into our EMS system today and you didn't. So you did do absolutely everything that you could have possibly done for those boys and for their families. Thank you. Don't doubt it. Okay. Don't doubt it. Don't doubt yourself. You're a strong clinician. You're a strong provider don't think so this too shall pass yes ma'am I, I i you you mentioned that quote i don't know two, two podcast or two ago um you talked about how you'd heard that and, and how it, it's kind of become the new thing and as silly as it sounds you want to go get tattooed well, i'll go with you let's go Hell um, yeah, dude. but ultimately i agree with that <laughs> Hell yeah. i agree with that this this too shall pass i mean it's, it's definitely good or bad we have those those times um, I had an old medic tell me a long time ago, you're going to have this roller coaster of a, a career, right? You're going to, you're going to save everyone you come in contact with, right? You're going to have this time frame when you are the badass, you are the best on the planet. Nobody dies in your care. And then you're going to have the valley where every single person you touch just dies and there's nothing you can do to save them. Um, and so you need to remember that. And I think that that thought process along with your, this two shall pass quote is, is good and bad, right? Remember we're, we're really good at times and we're really unable to change the world at times. doesn't mean we're bad. We're just able to change the world. Um, and I think that's, that's huge. And, and I, I can't, um, I don't know how to put into words, how to express it to you, how incredible your podcast has been over the last few months or the last year. Um, we've talked about it again, a little offline and a little, you know, on the personal side of things, but um, what you're doing right now with this podcast, what you're doing in, in the EMS community is something I wish, any of us would have had the idea to do 20 years ago. I agree. Um, not the podcast existed 20 years ago, but you know, you know what I'm saying? Like it would have been huge for a lot of us um, getting into this to be able to have this, this ability to do this. And there's, there's many others out there. I'm not, you know, there's guys that go in and just do re re, re charts and, and talk about what we could do better. And I think those are all huge things, but I also think there's an opportunity just to have this conversation. 
just to have this conversation that, hey, we're not doing great sometimes. We're not doing really super well. And when you see that person in the hospital, and again, this one of the greatest things about EMS, one of the greatest things that I, I love about EMS is our community, right? Yeah. I may not know you super well, right? We've, we, I don't know that you and I have ever shared a meal together, right? But we've seen each other at the hospital a dozen times. And I know that if I look at your face and I see those little bit of tears or that potential for you to cry, I can just walk over and give you a hug. And it doesn't, I don't know what's going on. You don't, you don't have to tell me what's going on, but we have that community. And I think we need to be better about that community. Um, especially some of us have been around here for a little while. Um, there's a few people at, at, at the ambulance company that we both have worked for in the past um, that aren't super good about doing that. Um, right. And then there's some that are really, really good. I ran into someone the other day. She's, she's tattooed from head to toe and she's been in a couple calendars cause she's a beautiful tattooed Hispanic woman. Right. And she walked up to me <laughs> And she walked up to me and she didn't, she didn't say a word. She didn't say anything. And she just gave me a hug and she started crying. And I don't know why she was upset. I didn't ask her. And I started crying and we just hugged each other in the middle of downtown ER um, for a minute. And then she smiled and I smiled and she went and got back in her truck and I went and got back in my truck and it, it changed my entire day. It changed her entire day. What you're doing right now with this podcast is changing entire days and entire worlds. And you should be very proud of yourself. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I, I feel pretty good about it. And, you know, it's funny that you talk about just going and hugging people randomly in the ER. I mean, it's happened. It's we've all done that. And without like, I think without having the emotional intelligence to recognize like why we're doing it or what we're doing it for or whatever. But, you know, I, I can tell you, there's a couple of people that I've gone at, um, one of the downtown facilities where you just walk up and you hug and you have to cry because you have to get it out and then you're good and you keep going on with your day, <laughs> you know? Absolutely. Sometimes you Absolutely. just need it. Absolutely. And I, and again, I think that what we need to do is a, is maybe a, as a community, especially an, an older community. What I mean by that is those of us who have a little, little bit more wisdom than others, right? Age is, is a part of it, but also just wisdom is, is start looking for those younger people and telling them it's okay telling them it's okay to be upset, telling them it's okay to, to do this, giving some random person that you haven't seen a hundred times in the ER because you know they're having a bad day, just go give them a hug, give them a handshake, tell them it's going to be okay. Um, it's something I've tried to do in the last few months. It's something that I've been trying to encourage my crew to do in the last few months. And I think it's something we need to encourage each other to do occasionally. Hugging is a beautiful thing. It is. I think, I think COVID took that away from a lot of us for a long time and I think it's finally coming back. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Well, JJ, I just want to give you the opportunity to talk about anything else that you want to talk about before we close up. Um, okay. I guess my, my last kind of final thoughts is if, if you're new to the, if you're new to EMS, if you're new to emergency man medicine, if you're new to sort of this world that we all live in, right, whether it's the fire department or the or private ambulance or flight or whoever it is, nursing, um, if you're new to it, seek out a counselor. Find someone, and when I say counselor, it doesn't have to be a professional, it doesn't have to be some psychologist that you know you got to pay money to, but find that person, find that person that you can talk to and be really, really honest with about what we see and what we do. Um, and then all, I guess the last part of that would be is um, encourage each other, hold each other, you know, not only accountable for being really good clinicians, but also teaching and, and shaping the next generation. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And great, great, great advice. Um, JJ, I appreciate you coming out today and I, and the, the conversation has been fantastic. I enjoy talking to you, even if it's just in quick text, it's nice catching up and kind of going over how the day is going or whatever. Um, so I really appreciate you coming on and, and kind of keeping up with, with the, uh, all the episodes and chatting with me about it. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the chance. I would love, uh, if you need anything else, let me know. I'd love to help in any way that I can. When I, when I get some of these other PTSD ranch camping outdoor adventure stuff kind of finalized, I'm, I'll, I'll reach out to you and we can try to figure out a way to maybe broadcast that to the world. Awesome. Yes. Let's please, please, please do that. JJ, I hope you have a good day and I hope you enjoy the rest of your night. Thanks so much. I appreciate you. Yeah. I appreciate you, night. buddy. <laughs> Bye. 
Thank you for listening. Before we wrap up, we have a few important announcements to share with you. Firstly, we're excited to announce the launch of our brand new 911 Nonsense Facebook group page. It's a community where everyone can go to connect, share ideas, discuss topics from the show, and get all of the most recent updates about the podcast. We'd love to have you join us and be part of the conversation. Next, we want to ask you to rate and review our podcast on your preferred platform. Your feedback means the world to us and helps us reach a wider audience. By rating and reviewing the show, you'll be supporting us in a big way and helping others discover 911 nonsense. If you enjoy what we do and would like to support the podcast even further, we have a few options available. You can visit samspursuit.com to find the links to our 911 nonsense merch page and our recently released noon gear page. Every contribution, no matter the size, goes a long way in helping us continue to better the podcast. We know that not everyone is comfortable being on the podcast, but we still want to hear your stories and experiences. If you have a compelling story and would like to share it to be read by me in a future episode, please reach out to us via email at 911nonsense at gmail.com or through our website's contact section. If you choose to be anonymous, we'll make sure to respect your privacy while sharing your story in a way that resonates with our audience. Thank you again for tuning in. We truly appreciate your support and look forward to bringing you more engaging content in the future. See you next week.